Uh, well, this morning we are doing uh, part three of this little mini-series. This is the last week we're doing, uh, looking at our vision, our mission, and our strategy. And uh, if we can actually bring up that, that uh, graphic we've looked at to start off every sermon, uh, just to kind of remind ourselves of a little bit of the difference. Because I know everyone kind of has their own little twist on what a vision is and what mission is and all those things, and that's great. I just want to show you how we see vision, mission, and strategy. So our vision, we've said that this answers the question, why do we exist? Why are we here? Why does the church, the universal church of Jesus Christ, exist? Why did God put us here? Why, why when he saved us, why did he not just rapture us up into heaven to be with him? Why did he leave us here in Escondido? What's the point? And for us, we see that the vision that, that is revealed in the word of God is to see God's glory among the nations to the least, the last, and the lost. We believe that the church of Jesus Christ exists so that we can see God's glory be spread throughout the entire world. That's what our job is. That's what our big goal is. That's our end game. Now the mission then answers the question, what do we got to do in order to see that happen? And for us, we believe that the word of God shows us that we need to, as a church, make disciples who make disciples, locally here in Escondido and globally, however the Lord would send us, who are saved, equipped, and sent by the gospel. Saved by the power of the gospel, equipped by the gospel, and then sent by the power of the gospel. Sent meaning here and there. Uh, we, don't, we don't ever want to get in a mentality where sent people just go somewhere else. You have been sent exactly where you are right now. Now God may send you elsewhere, but you've been sent right here. We are all sent in, in, a, in one sense of the word. So then thirdly, we're going to look at this, the strategy. How then do we do this mission? It, it's, it is one thing for me just to tell you what the mission is. All right, guys, we've got to go make disciples of all nations. Ready? Break. And then you just go and you're like, okay, what do we do now? And that's why we need to know what the strategy is. And, and, and again, I've, I said this last week, I've said this multiple times, I don't want to come up with some cute strategy that's unique to Life Mission Church and then say, God, would you bless our strategy? I want to look in God's word and say, God, what is the strategy that you have given the church of Jesus Christ? And we want to get on board with that. I don't want to have some little, you know, cutesy niche thing that is just our own little uh, kind of pet strategy. That's just human wisdom and it's just going to be a fad that's just going to fade away at some point. I believe that God has given the church, his people throughout the course of human history, a strategy to see the vision come to pass, to see the mission be accomplished. And it's our job, church, to look in his word to find out what is that strategy. What, what can I, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a brother, what can I bet my life on as a strategy? You see what I'm saying? Like, you go to a church that has, like, their own kind of cute little strategy. Would you bet your life and your discipleship and your parenting and everything on that? See, see, I want to be part of a church that we can say we can bet our life on the strategy. And the only way we can do that is if that strategy is in the word of God. And that's what we want to look at today. And I believe that what we're going to look at today is the strategy that God has given, not Life Mission Church, but to his church, his people, his kids. I don't want to do anything new. I want to do something that's eternal and old something that's been proven and has a proven track record through the course of history in the church. And that's what we're going to be about. It's not maybe as flashy as other churches. It's not maybe as you know, cool or innovative. But I'll just say this. I think that God is the most innovative being ever. And I think our kind of cute little ways of sort of trying to rehash what he's told us to do is just kind of, it's just, it becomes a, a mess. So, I want to pray now and ask the Lord just to really just show us and drive this into our hearts so we don't just uh, take it as something that I, I think, but I want to really get in the word to see this is really what God has told us to do as his people. Father in heaven, we thank you that you uh, are a God who does not just leave us here to wander the earth and wonder how we're going to uh, accomplish what you have called us to do. But you actually, you do tell us how. You show us how. And not just by your example, but you actually give us truth. You give us instruction. 
And your word walks us through how we get the power that we need for ministry. Your word walks us through the, the strategy, what we need to do, how we need to do it. So we're not just left empty-handed, wandering, wondering what we're doing and, and how to do it. And I pray that this morning you would show us this. You'd convince us of this. You'd help us repent of even the, the little ways that we kind of devise our own little uh, plans and mechanisms and, and things that, are, uh, that we put together in our lives in order to accomplish the ministry you've called us to. We, we just want to repent of those things and we want to see clearly what you do actually call us to. So help us as we open your word today. We thank you. By your Holy Spirit, we pray that he would lead us into truth this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you could, uh, open up to John chapter 15. There's so much in this. Uh, we've, we've gone through this, this scripture uh, a few times before. But I want to show us this again to show what Jesus shows us, how we are to produce fruit. Because if you remember on that graphic, that what we're aiming to do is produce fruit for the purpose of God's glory among the nations. The God's glory being shown through our lives in Escondido and beyond is we, we call it just bearing fruit. We want to provide fruit and shade as oaks of righteousness that as we dig our roots into the water of the gospel, we eventually provide fruit and shade for the nations. Now, to, pr to produce fruit, we have to figure out, okay, how, how do we produce fruit then? Do we just conjure it up? Do we just work hard at it? What do we do? So John 15 gives us uh, the answer here. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Okay, that's the first big important key here. You as a Christian cannot bear spiritual fruit by yourself. You cannot do it. You can produce physical fruit, fleshly fruit, but you cannot produce spiritual fruit by yourself. Impossible. Unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can't do nothing. If you go down a few verses to verse 8. By this my Father is glorified. Okay, what's our vision? Is to see God glorified among the nations. Okay, so we got to pay attention. How do we glorify God? If that's what our big goal is, how do we do it? This is how you do it, church. This is what Jesus is telling us. You glorify the Father in heaven by bearing much fruit and proving to be my disciples. What's our mission? Make disciples, make disciples. You see our vision, mission, strategy entwined in these few verses here. If we want to see the vision happen, we have to be proven to be disciples who are saved, equipped, and sent in the, by the gospel. And he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, so abide in my love. If we want to prove ourselves to be disciples who make disciples, who are saved by the gospel, equipped and sent by the gospel, sent to see fruit being born among the nations that would bring glory to God, to the least, the last, and the lost. If we want to do that, then we need to abide in the love of Jesus. Now, when you think through this word, uh, abide, it means to, to dwell, to dwell, to live in the love of of Jesus. Not just know factually, theologically, philosophically, not just know the love of Jesus, but to live in the love of Jesus. To dwell in the presence of Jesus. To look upon his face. We just sang the song, as I look upon your face. To, to see him high and lifted up in your life. Despite all your circumstances, despite everything, we, we behold and we dwell in the shelter of the Almighty. That's, that's how we abide. We, we live, we endure, we remain in his presence and we remain before him. But that task of seeing God's glory in our lives is too big for us. He says here, you can do nothing apart from me. We are naked, poor, wretched, and blind, as it says in Revelation. 
So unless we abide in the vine, then, then we can't see this fruit-bearing life that we all desire. We need to have the power of God working through us to see God's glory among the nations. But to do that, though, we first have to have the power of God working in us. So you can't, you can't give out what's not already in you. So if you're not abiding in the love of Jesus, if you're not swimming in the gospel, then how on earth are you going to see God's glory among the nations through you if you got nothing to give out? You're just going to give out your own philosophy or your own good advice or, or your misery because you're not living in the joy of Christ. You're going to make disciples who are like you and you're miserable because you're living a legalistic, empty Christianity. And so you will make disciples like you. If you are not abiding in the joy of Christ, you will make other disciples that are miserable. We have first have to have the joy of Christ living inside of us, that we are swimming in the beauty of Jesus, enjoying who he is. When we do that, then we will be overflowing with the beauty of Christ, and that will be shining through the nations. Like it says in Matthew 5, let your light shine before men so they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But if you're not living in the light yourself, what light are you going to be shining? You're going to be shining the light of you. I'll be shining the light of Joby among the nations. I don't want to shine the light of Joby among the nations. I want to shine the light of Jesus among the nations that are darkened by sin. So we have to first have the power of God working in us before we have the power of God working through us. Okay, we, we have to have that. So this is why on the graphic again, actually if you could bring it up one more time, we see that above and below the tree here, God's glory in our hearts is our fuel. If you're not beholding God's glory in your heart, what are you gonna be producing? You're going to be just producing yourself. So we have to have God's glory in our hearts. That's got to be the fuel. That's got to be the fire that, that causes us to burn for the nations. The love of Christ, the gospel, has got to be our fuel. It's got to be the thing that we are loving so much. When we have, are rooted in the gospel of God's glory, we become the strong oak of righteousness, a disciple who is equipped and being sent by the gospel, who is making other disciples. And when that happens, then we see, you can't see it because of the shadow, but you see God's glory among the nations. The fruit then that is being born the leaves and the fruit that's coming from your life as you are rooted in the glory of God and you are loving the glory of God, then you will then bear fruit that gives glory to God. And so we say that the, the gospel, God's glory, the love of Christ has to be the fuel that we abide in in order for us to get to the end goal. It's our fuel and it's our goal. It's the beginning and it's the end and it's everything in between. But that's got to be it. Our motivation has to be our love for Jesus and his love for us. So therefore, we must first be delighting in the gospel if we want to see others love the gospel. Uh, in your notes, it says this, the gospel of God's glory is the fuel and goal of our mission. And then, so now we think to ourselves, okay, if that's, if that's what it is, then what is our strategy how do we become this disciple who's making disciples? Uh, I've got a couple of graphics I'm going to show you guys. I've showed these before, uh, but it's important to see them again just to kind of give us a visual. Uh, if we can bring up the first um, graphic here, the, the one that I think it's just our uh, logo. Uh, I just want to show you this. Um, you guys know our logo. That's, most of you guys see three arrows pointing out. Well, some of you get more creative types also see three arrows pointing in. All right, you see those? Uh, in, a, in, a, in a larger kind of a broader scope. All this means is we want to see people come into the church, saved by the gospel. Once they're in the church, they're equipped by the gospel, and then they're sent out by the gospel. So we have our saved, equipped, and sent kind of wrapped into the in arrows and the out arrows. But also in kind of a little subcategory, uh, I see this also as a reminder for us that we receive God's grace by various means. And we're going to look at this morning the three primary means that God shows us in his word that he dispenses grace to us, that we behold the glory of Jesus. The three primary ways is through the word of God, through prayer, and through gospel community. And so as the grace of God goes into the believer, into the disciple, by those, those means, 
then that disciple is then equipped and changed by the power of that gospel, and then that disciple goes out to the world to share the, the glory of the gospel to the nations. So that's kind of a, kind of a, a sub-use of our logo. So on the next slide here, though, we want to define what is a disciple? I said this last week, the disciple is a life growing in, but also giving out the gospel, giving out the gospel of the grace of Christ, the glory of God. A disciple is someone who is living in and dwelling in and in the glory of God as seen in the gospel. And then a disciple also is one who is dispensing that gospel to others, that grace, bestowing that grace, showing uh, their light before men so that others would glorify the Father in heaven. And so now if you look at the next one, uh, graphic number three in the shadows up there, but uh, the word of God being the, the first means of grace that we're going to be looking at today, uh, the word of God, it, it, it shows us, it tells us who God is. Uh, so in our church, for instance, we have, uh, we, we encourage people to have personal time in the word, listening to sermons, not just mine, but other uh, people who preach the, the proper gospel, books, online resources, equipping classes, uh, then also prayer, the, the second one uh, in our church Learning how to preach the gospel to yourself, which we'll talk about a little bit today, if you've never heard that phrase before. Uh, confession of sin and temptation and repentance of sin. Confessing it to, to people, to the Lord as well, but also to people. Uh, worship and thanksgiving and just daily dependence on God. And then also gospel community. Uh, we, see, we have our community groups. Uh, small groups of people who get together to gospel each other, to use gospel as a verb, to point each other to the gospel, preach the gospel into people's lives. Uh, we call fight clubs, uh, which are just one-on-one -on -one time. We talked about this the last week or two, uh, meaning that when we get together, one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one, whatever, uh, we fight for the gospel. If I'm uh, downcast, I'm not I'm, I'm kind of down on myself, I need someone to fight for the gospel, to fight through, not fight me, but fight through the, the lies that I'm believing. And they're going to fight for the gospel to be, have preeminence in my thought process. Uh, service and sacrifice. Serving on Sundays. Serving throughout the week. Uh, mission, both here locally and globally. And also baptism and taking communion every week. So that's just kind of a, a really broad overview. Uh, but here's the thing. These means of grace, as we call them, do these things in themselves produce power? For ministry. They don't. These things in themselves do not produce power for ministry. Okay, the Pharisees. Did the Pharisees know the word of God? Oh yeah. Did they pray? Yes, they did. Did they go to synagogue all the time? Absolutely. Do, did, have you ever in your life, either yourself or know someone who knows the word but does not love Jesus? Have you ever prayed in your life before even knowing Christ? Did you ever go to church and you're just kind of going through the motions? See, these things in themselves do not produce power. These are the means by which we receive God's grace and God's power. These are conduits. It's a pipeline to receive the water of the power of the gospel. But they in themselves, as disciplines, aren't going to change your life unless these things bring you to the gospel. So your prayer can just bring you to yourself and your own selfish needs, can't it? Going to church can just bring you what you need. You just need some social time or you need to look good to others. If you're using these things as a means for your own reasons, then nothing's going to change. These are a means to bring you to the gospel. That's the power. These are a means to bring you to Jesus. Doing things does not change you. Jesus changes you. And God gives us means by which we can be brought to Jesus so we can be face to face with his beauty and with his power. Graciously, he gives us these means for his grace. But in and of themselves, they don't do it. John Owen, the great theologian from the 1600s, he said, spiritual disciplines can trim the roots of sin, but only the gospel can pull the roots out. You can kind of keep sin at bay, you know, you're, you're, you're tempted to, to just kind of surf the web and do whatever and you go, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. Okay, the Bible technically actually kind of kept you from sin temporarily. But if the Bible does not bring you to the life-changing and heart-changing power of the gospel, you'll have just temporarily kept sin at bay for a moment. 
But when that Bible, when the word of God brings you face to face with Jesus and your heart's changed and all of a sudden you don't want all that sin because you love Jesus more, that's when the roots of sin have been pulled out. Okay, so these things are just a means. They're not, they're not the end game. This is a way to get to Jesus. Now I want to show you this. I, I love this little section of scripture. Jeremiah 17, if you could open there because we'll be in about five or six verses here. Because for us, as you see that graphic of the, the tree with the roots, we need roots, conduits, because roots, all roots are for a tree. It's just a conduit, right? It's just a pipeline to water. That's what a root is. So these roots, the word of God, prayer, community, we need roots that go deep into the ground to get good water. So we need the word of God to take us deep into the presence of Jesus, not just give us some theological understanding and, and these little, you know, kind of philosophical constructs and, and legalistic things. Like, we need the roots to take us deep into the presence of Jesus. We need our prayer life to take us deep before the face of God the Father. We need our, our, our community time to be deep, going into repentance and confession of sin, being vulnerable so that others can bring us face to face with Jesus. Jeremiah 17, five, this is so interesting, this contrast. It says, thus says the Lord, curses the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Now, does a shrub have roots? Yeah, a shrub has roots. Do these roots, do this shrub any good? No. Why? Because it's in parched land. Those roots are not going into the water. So it's alive, but it's dying. Christian, you can be a Christian who is alive because of Jesus, but starving. You have roots. You've got a Bible. You've got some type of a prayer life. You go to church, but you're dying on the inside. And I don't mean unto eternal death. If you've been born again by the grace of Jesus, you'll never die an eternal death, but you will starve to death, like a, just a communal death, not enjoying the union you have with Christ because your communion with Christ is cut off from the water source. And you'll starve and you'll be miserable. You're like a shrub in the desert. You're alive, you've got roots, but you're not digging into anything. And so no life is coming to you. However, in verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and doesn't fear when heat comes, when trial comes and circumstances. Its leaves remain green even through hardship. Because their trust is in the Lord, not in circumstances, not in man, not in your spouse, not in your kids, not in your job, not in your ministry. Your trust is in the Lord because your roots are deeply embedded in the water of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you don't fear when he comes because the leaves remain green. You don't get anxious in the year of drought when things just aren't going your way. You don't get anxious because your trust is in the Lord. And it doesn't cease to bear fruit. You're bearing spiritual fruit because your fruit is dependent on the roots that take you to the water source. And so you continue to bear fruit even when all hell breaks loose in your life. Exactly the song that we opened up with today. When our circumstances, everything is before us, they fade away because we're face to face with Jesus. Interestingly enough, this is where we go into the verse here that says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. See, church, we deceive ourselves. We put our trust in ourselves. We put our trust in our own wisdom and discernment and we put our trust in other people. Our hearts deceive us. Who can understand that I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds? Now, another graphic I'd like to show you is this one I've showed you before of a power drill. Because this is a, a great way to look. You've got a power drill. I picked that up at Home Depot the other day. They have life mission power drills. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so excited about that. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? Uh, we're, like, we're like a power drill. We're, we're an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. 
right? But in itself, a power drill is, is worthless. You just, you know, it can be a good hammer, maybe, but it's a power drill that isn't being used for what it's meant to be. So uh, the next slide here, uh, we, we show, uh, I, I actually forget, what, lifestyle of discipleship, that's what it was. Living in God's grace, power for ministry, power for sin, going and making disciples. That's what we need to do. That's what a drill as us, that's what we should do as an instrument. But then the next one, uh, we see this. We need the gospel of God's grace to be our source. Okay, if the gospel is the source for us to live a lifestyle of discipleship, we need to somehow connect ourselves to that power source. The drill and an, and an outlet doesn't do anything either. There's got to be a way for that drill to get the power. Just sitting it next to it isn't going to do anything. All right, so this is why we need the cord in the middle. These are the means of grace. The word of God, prayer and communion with Christ, gospel community. We're, we're, the, we're the instrument. God is the power source. But we need a way to connect we need a way to receive the power of God, the power for ministry, the power for discipleship, the power for repentance, the power for confession, the power that you need to be vulnerable to have that power. You've got to find a way to connect to that power source, and that's the means of grace. This is the power cord for us. Okay, those are the roots of the tree. The roots, the, the tree can't bear fruit unless the roots go into the source of water. Okay, so all these things, thinking through this, that you will be running on empty day to day, week to week, if you, now listen, listen closely, not if you neglect the word, not if you neglect prayer, not if you neglect the church, but if those things aren't being used to bring you to Jesus. You can be in the word all day long and be in prayer all day long, but if those things aren't bringing you to Jesus, you'll be running on empty. You'll be trusting in your own strength, your own uh, pious, holier-than-thou living. So if you're neglecting not those means, but if you're neglecting those means as a true means to get to Jesus, then you will be running on empty. You'll be a power drill that is just almost worthless. A power drill that, yeah, and you can, you know, like I said, you can still be used as a hammer, but that's not what you were made to do. You can bring glory to yourself in some other random way, but that's not what you were created to do. You're created to be a power drill, not a hammer. But to be that power drill, you've got to be connected to the power source. So we want to look, just kind of a, an overview. Again, if you go on our website and other places, uh, I've got multiple sermons on these three things, Word of God, Prayer, and Community, much more thorough. But we're just going to do a little flyover, more or less. But I do encourage you to uh, go and either watch those sermons or look up the notes, uh, other scriptures, uh, other quotes from other uh, people, whatever it might be. Uh, but we'll do a little flyover here. So when it comes to the word of God, as kind of our first means of grace, the main means of grace that we understand and know the gospel, we know the glory of God. Uh, what is the purpose of the word of God? Now, have you ever uh, tried to read someone's mind? Like your spouse. Or has your spouse ever expected you to know what is on their mind? <laughs> I see lots of heads going like this right now. And some people tend to be really discreet. John Stott, one of my favorite theologians, says this, we can't even read each other's minds, other human beings, much less read what is on the mind of God. I mean, think about that for a second. You can't read your spouse's mind, who is a finite creature like yourself, who you've been living with for 10, 15, 20 years. You can't still, yet even after 20 years, read their mind. How do we expect to know the mind of God? So he says, we can't do that, much less what is on the mind of God. Then he follows up that, and he says, God has clothed his thoughts in words. He's taken all of his thoughts, his invisible thoughts, his eternal thoughts, and he decided, out of mercy and love towards us, he wanted us to know them, but he knew we couldn't read his mind, so he clothed his thoughts to become visible, and he put them in the form of words. Not only that, but we also see that the word of God also became flesh. So he took his thoughts and he clothed them also in Jesus, the person of Christ. But God has clothed his thoughts in words. And John Stott, he says that there is no way to know him except by knowing the scriptures. And that's an interesting statement. I've had a lot of people push back on that one with me before. We say, well, no, there's other ways we can know God. We can know God like God can give us a dream or God can answer me in prayer. Oh, okay. But how, if you get an answer for prayer, how do you know that's God and not you? Unless you can test it with the word of God. How do you know the character of God 
if you say, well, I just really feel like God wants me to do this. How do you know that's what God would feel that for you unless you know the character of God which is revealed in his word? I say, well, I know God. I know that God's a, a creator because I see this creation. How do you know God's a creator unless the word of God says, in the beginning there was nothing and God created all things? Now, those things can tell you stuff about God, but we can't know for sure if that is actually factually God unless we have the word that gives us clarity on those things. Uh, I, I, learned, I learned many things about God when I became a father myself. But how can I know God as a father unless his word told me, I am your father? I learned a lot about my union with Christ when I got married and I experienced the union I have with my wife and how that's an illustration for the gospel and Christ's love for me. But how would I know that marriage is a picture of my union with Christ unless the word of God already told me that marriage is a picture of my union with Christ? See, everything, everything that we learn and discern about God kind of in our, our world has to be filtered through the word of God. And so you can learn about God in other ways, but all those things have to be tested against the word of God. And so we go back to Stott's statement here that God has closed his thoughts in his words and there's no way to, to really know him, to know that this really is God who's you know, uh, revealing something to you or speaking to you or, or giving you direction. You can't know it unless you know his character, unless you know his ways, unless you know about him. You know, I, I can't... I can't get to know my wife just by talking to her, me talking to her. I've got to listen to her. She has to express her thoughts to me. So we can't just say, well, I just, I just, you know, I've got a great prayer life and, you know, this and that, but I don't really, you know, I'm not really into theology and the word, whatever. Well, then you don't know who the real Jesus is. So you're saying you just, you talk to God all the time, but you never let him speak to you through his word? Then how do you know him? How do you, are you just talking to your invisible friend? Because that's really what we're doing. We're making God into our image when we don't know who he is as revealed in scripture and through the person of Jesus Christ. So that's why we say that the word of God is the primary means of grace. Uh, St. Jerome, uh, one of the early saints in the church, he said that ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. If you don't know scripture, you don't know Jesus. He has chosen divinely to reveal himself in his word. So if we want to behold the beauty and the glory of Christ and be enamored by him and have the power of him change us from the inside out, we've got to be in the word in a way that brings us to him. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, speaking to the Thessalonian church, so I can say this to you, Life Mission Church, I thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us or you heard from me, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is. It's the word of God. But then he says this, the word of God which is at work in believers. So the word of God goes to work in you. It's not just information. It's there for transformation. The word of God is alive. It's living and active. So when the word of God goes in you, it works in you to change your heart and change the affections of your heart and the desires you have in your heart. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you desires of your heart. He gives you new desires when you delight in him. When you're in the word, delighting in who he has revealed himself to be in his word, you get new desires. It goes to work in you powerfully. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Here's why. Here's, here's the so that. Here's the purpose why the word of God teaches us and corrects us. So that the man of God, so that you, church, son, daughter of the living God, so that you can be complete, equipped for every good work. If you want to be equipped and see God's glory among the nations to the least, last, and lost through your life as a disciple making disciples then you need the word of God to breathe into you, teach you, reprove you, correct you, and train you so that you can be made complete and equipped for every good work. The word of God does the equipping. 
You don't equip yourself. The word of God is, is the power of God that equips you. The gospel is the power of God. It changes us from the inside out. See, life and emotions and circumstances, all that changes. Your talent changes. Your gifting changes. Your, your body changes. In 20 years, you're not going to be able to do some of the things you can do today. All that's going to change. But the word of Christ abides forever. And it never changes. It's fixed in the heavens for all eternity. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalm 138 says that the word of God, along with the name of God, is above all things. I mean, you realize that? That God has placed his word, God has placed his word alongside his name, which is his character, his, he, he places his word above everything. Which tells me, church, that we too should place his word above everything in our life. We should place his word and his name above all things in our life. If God does it, we should do it. He places all things above. Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them like bread and your words became to me a joy. They became a joy. So what we see here is that God's word was not a joy to Jeremiah at one point in his life. It was boring to him or it was irrelevant to him, whatever. But he ate. He was diligent in eating the word. And then it became a joy, just like in the Psalms where I just, I just quoted that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Feast on the word of God and it will become a joy and the delight of my heart, Jeremiah says, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Build an appetite for the word of God. Stare at the glory of God until you see it, until you behold it, until you enjoy it. Press in the promises of God until you believe it. And don't expect immediate results. That isn't usually how it happens. You have to be kind of like a, a foreign exchange student. You're going into uncharted territories. You're not used to believing truth every day. You believe lies and your own desires. You gotta be like a foreign exchange student that goes into a different culture and just immerses yourself in that culture and over time, you learn the language. You go into the word of God and you stare at the word of God and you memorize the word of God until finally you start believing the word of God. Now the word of God just comes out of your mouth and goes into your mind when you're tempted and now it's just natural for you. But it's, it's not your first nature. Our first nature, church, is sin and lies and deception and selfishness and self-centeredness. That's our first nature. Now we've got a new nature that is at war with our flesh and we've got to immerse ourselves in this language, which is truth. And all of a sudden, we start speaking truth and believing truth. And that truth, God's word tells us, sets us free. That truth changes us. Uh, Spurgeon says it was God's word that made us. God spoke us into creation. Is it any wonder that it's God's word that will also sustain us? See, God doesn't just make you, speak you into existence and then let you be. No, he, he upholds all things by the word of his power. That's what it says in the word of God. He upholds all things by his word. I hate to move on because I love the topic, but we're going to move on. Prayer. prayer. Prayer is a way. See, the, the gospel itself, the gospel is not the ABCs of our faith. The beginning that we believe when we get saved. The gospel is the A to Z of our faith. The beginning, the end. God's glory is the source. God's glory is the goal. Everything in between, should be, we should be enamored by God's glory. The gospel is not the starting point for your discipleship. You start the day you got saved and you thank God for the gospel and now you're on to discipleship and discipline and, and obeying and all these things. No, the gospel is the path itself. The gospel is the journey that we stay on. It's the path we stay on through the whole course of our life. And one of the primary ways we stay on that path and we stay in communion with God himself is through prayer. You know, if, if God's word is, how is spoken to us, he shows himself to us, prayer is how we even speak back to God, we verbalize to God, we, we empty ourselves before God, we, we let him know the cry of our heart, our despair, our fears, our desires. We empty ourselves before God. We use prayer to re remind ourselves 
of the gospel. We, we learn how to pray the gospel. That's why I put on the graphic, preaching the gospel to yourself. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a form of prayer. Some of the old guys, like Jonathan Edwards calls it soliloquy, where you kind of speak to yourself in prayer. You, you, you know, it's not that God doesn't know his promises. He knows his promises. But in your prayer, you got to remind yourself of his promises. You say, God, I know that you will never leave me, nor will you ever take me. I know that, that you're going to walk me through this, this shadow of this valley of this death that I'm experiencing right now in my marriage or in this sickness or whatever it is. You, you don't need to remind him that he's going remi- to walk you through the shadow of the valley of death, but you do this, this, this it's, it's called soliloquy or just preaching the gospel to yourself, praying the gospel truth where you say, God, I, I want to believe this. Help me believe this truth about yourself. I know you believe it, God, but help me believe this that I can cast my cares upon you because you care for me. God, I I know that your word is above all things, but right now I'm not really desiring your word. But I know that that I I keep myself from sin by storing your word up in my heart. That's what your word says in Psalm 119, verse 9 and 10. But God, help me. So you're learning how to pray the gospel. See, that's the kind of prayer that keeps your roots in the water, in the gospel. It can't just be a prayer, God, give me this, God, give me that. Now, pray that God would give you things. Jesus tells us to ask for things. Ask for your daily bread. Ask the Lord for stuff. Go to him. But this prayer should be accompanied and just living in a desire for the gospel. These, These requests, these desires in light of the gospel. Always, 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 always have the gospel and God's promises in your prayer time. If you're in dire financial need and you're praying a lot for some financial uh, help or, uh, uh, or some marital help, pray for those things. But always, always have the gospel in your prayer somehow. If your prayer just leads you to some solutions you need, that's not, a, that's not really, a, it's, not, it's not the kind of prayer that is modeled in the scripture. Your prayer should lead you to Jesus who provides you your needs. He's the gift that we seek. Ask him for the things you need, but always have your prayer time bring you to Jesus and his promises and his truth. Always incorporate those things into your asking. That's why we, we always talk about the prayer model that you see in, uh, in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. We kind of divvy it up with P-R-A-Y. Preach the gospel yourself. First start with the gospel then the R is repent, repent of anything, any attitude, any lack of faith, any lack of trust in God's provision that you maybe are feeling. God, I'm not really believing right now that you are gonna provide all things for me. I'm not really believing right now that you, that you won't leave me or forsake me. I kind of feel distant from you and I'm not believing, so I need to repent of that attitude. Then the A, ask. Now God, I'm, I'm asking that you give me faith. Help, help me in my unbelief. Help me with this financial situation. Help me in my marriage. I don't know what's going on. My kids are out of control. I've got this sickness. My, 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 my mother, my father is sick. I'm, I'm asking you, Lord. I'm repenting of faithlessness and now I'm asking you for, for healing or, or whatever it is. And then the why, we yield. And then at the end we say, but God, we yield to you. Let your will be done and not ours. And that's just, that's the model that Jesus gives us in Matthew 6. He says, when you pray, pray like this. He has that element of reminding ourselves that God is our Father in heaven, that his will be done on earth and in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Preaching the gospel, repentance, asking, and yielding. I'm not saying that every time you pray, you have to have all four of those things in there, but, but I would definitely absolutely say always, always, always have the gospel as part of your time in prayer. Learn to do it. Discipline yourself to do it. Work at it. Remember the P-R-A-Y. Just try it. Incorporate that as part of your prayer time. That is what is going to keep you rooted in the gospel. Uh, In your notes it says this, that though the gospel itself, God's grace, the blood of Jesus, perpetually and eternally keeps us anchored in God's grace. That's what Hebrews 6 says. But he gives us various means to keep us chained to that anchor. We could call this the difference between union and communion. So the blood of Christ, that's why I said you're never going to die unto eternal death if you're a born-again believer, but you're going to miss out on the communion you have with Christ. You'll always have union because that's by the faithfulness of Jesus, but you're going to miss out on enjoying Jesus and communing with him if we, uh, if we neglect these disciplines as uh, form or, or means to get us to Christ. And so this uh, prayer time is what keeps us abiding in Christ. 
using the word of God in our prayer time, but then going to him. Uh, it also says this in your, in your notes. A tree doesn't grow strong just by trying hard. It grows strong by immersing its roots in the water. Trees are wholly dependent on water. Roots are not for growing ourselves, but for receiving grace. These means are, are not for growing yourself and becoming a better person. These, these, these means have been given to us so that we could connect ourselves to the grace of Jesus. That's what changes us. So we've got to learn how to abide. Going back to John 15, seeking Christ himself, learning how to preach the gospel to ourselves in our prayer time. And then thirdly, gospel community. When you look all over the word, you realize that the language of the gospel is primarily plural. Our Father in heaven. Uh, nothing can separate us. You see just plural language everywhere when speaking of the gospel. This is a communal thing. We're in this together as a family. We've been, I was talking with someone the other day and I, just, I, I love this, this truth that in Romans 8 when it says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, neither, neither death nor famine nor nakedness nor anything that's in the earth or above the earth, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That is such a beautiful and incredible promise we have about us and God. But you know what is equally as true that we derive from that? is that because you and I have both been saved by the blood of Christ, because we've been united as to be part of the body of Christ with Christ as the head, you could actually say the same thing about you and me. So, Brandon, nothing can separate you and me. No nakedness, nor death, nor sorrow, nor famine. Nothing can separate me and Brandon, or me and Don. Nothing can separate us as brothers and sisters because we've been saved by Christ. And we're going to enjoy eternity forever. Nothing, church, can separate you from the person sitting next to you if they're a born-again believer. Now, their sin can divide the communion you have with them, right? Your sin's going to separate you from the fellowship with those people. Your sin will separate you from the fellowship with Jesus. But eternally speaking, your union with Christ also dictates your union with the people in this room and across this globe. So nothing can separate you from the other believers in this room. Nothing can separate you from them. There's no famine. There's no death. There's no sickness. Nothing above the earth or in the earth that can separate you from the people that have been saved by Jesus Christ. Nothing. That's amazing. We're in this together, church. Whether you like it or not, we're in this together. We are eternally bound together by the blood of Christ. And nothing can separate you. Nothing at all can separate you from your brothers and sisters and Jesus. And so with that in mind, Hebrews 3.13 says, So then exhort one another every day, encourage each other, challenge each other, as long as it's called today, so that none of you can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You need people that love Jesus and love you to speak into your life where you have blind spots. And when they point out your blind spots, you're going to argue and you're going to say, no, that's not me. You don't know my heart. Well, actually, you know, Jeremiah 17 says, you don't know your heart. <laughs> And so, so we, we say these things, but we need each other to point out each other's sin and faults in love and in care because we do care for each other. Abraham Kuyper uh, says this. I love this quote. He says, he is your friend who pushes you nearer to God. That is a friend. Whoever pushes you nearer to Jesus. See, that's what I'm saying. You can't just go to church and say, oh, I'm doing the disciplines of grace here. No, no, no. No, you need to be in community that pushes you actually near to God. Don't just go for the social aspect or whatever. Go because there are people that want to push you near to God. Spend time with those people. Seek those people out. Prioritize those people in your life. Work your schedule around the people who actually push you towards the gospel. People who want to pour into gospel truth. Build your schedule around those people as much as you can. You'll never regret spending all this time with people who love the gospel, people who want to disciple you, and people who want to pour into you. You'll never regret spending that time. You'll never say, gosh, I really wish I would have spent less time with that guy who just kept telling me the gospel. You're never going to say that. I wish I spent less time with that guy who poured his life into me or that gal who always reminded me of who I am in Christ. You're never, ever going to say that, church. 
You'll never regret that. So prioritize your schedule to be around people, men and women who point you to Jesus, who pour into your life. Do everything you can to be around those people. That's what it says, Hebrews 13, exhort each other every day. Every day, try to be around someone. Whether it's through text or whatever, be around someone every day who is gonna be pointing you to Jesus. Philippians 1.27 so let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, Paul says, if I'm with you or if I'm not with you, I can hear that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, fighting alongside each other for the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents, by the enemy. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from God. When the enemy sees a church that's united, not just, we don't just sing the same songs, and listen to the same sermon, but we're united, we're locked arm in arm, fighting for each other, pressing each other into the gospel, confiding one another, being vulnerable with one another, confessing sin to one another. When we do that, the enemy, it's a sure sign of their destruction. The enemy looks at a church like that and says, we, we're gonna try and try and try to divide that church and dismantle that church, but look at those guys. They're united in the gospel. I think we're gonna lose. And they will. However, and this is lastly, one more scripture. I want to say two things as we close here. First of all, a, a praise and a, a thanksgiving. As I mentioned on the way to church this morning, I, I thought to myself how when I stand up here before you guys, I look out and I just see a church that I'm so thankful for, a church that I love and I just love seeing your faces, and I love seeing and just knowing that God is bringing you guys through many things, good and bad. And I can give you just a great praise to God and thanksgiving that as, as we go through things in life and in our church family and, and whatever, uh, I see so many instances of where we church are doing what Philippians 1 says. I see so many of you that are fighting side by side with each other. I see so many of you who are carrying the burden of others in your life. Other people that have gotten so weakened by their own sin or someone else's sin or some kind of hardship. I see so many, so, so many of you carrying each other. It just, it, it, It just, uh, it just, it, it blows my mind sometimes. And I just, I hear, and I, I go through specific lists of people, specific instances where they're doing this. And, and a lot of these people don't even know they're even doing that. They're just doing it because that's what they, they've immersed themselves as that foreign exchange student. And now they're just doing ministry and they wouldn't even call it ministry. They're just living life. They're just being a disciple, making a disciple. And they don't even know it. Because as you just wrap yourself in the gospel, it just changes you. And before you know, you're, you're doing ministry. You don't even recognize it. And I can point out to so many of you that you're doing that. It's incredible. And just kind of from a selfish standpoint, I'm going to be honest, it helps me sleep at night. There's a saying that, you know, the, the shepherd doesn't sleep when he doesn't think the sheep are in the pen. And when I think about all the, the, the sin and the, just the destructiveness of sin and people that are hurting, and if I think that it's all on me, first of all, I'm wrong if I think that. Because first and foremost, Jesus is the good shepherd of this church. But when I know that people in our church are being cared for by other people, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be part of the caring, but that, I, that the burden is lifted because the burden is being spread out to the people of God. That's how it's supposed to be. And I, 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 I trust God easier <laughs> when I know that his people are taking care of each other. But however also, on the other end of that, I also see neglect of that. And way less people, for sure, but I see many people, a few people. <laughs> I'll be generous. But I see few people that are doing the opposite. They're not striving side by side. They're avoiding conflict. They're avoiding deep relationship. They're avoiding being challenged. 
They're not listening to the, the counsel or the, the, the loving advice that people are bringing to them. They're, they're insisting on their own thing and they're not prioritizing their life to be around gospel people. In Hebrews 10, it says this, and we'll close. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You've been designed to be vulnerable with each other, to depend on each other as each other points each other to the gospel, to listen to other people as they lovingly confront you in sin. You've been designed to be uh, in, uh, part of the body of Christ in a very real way, not just a theological way, but in a very real way. Don't neglect coming together with other people in community group and fight clubs, church, whatever it is, meeting with people, being honest, being real, confessing sin, confessing temptation. Don't avoid that. I know it's scary. I know it's scary. And I'm not expecting you to go from zero to 60 if you're not doing any of it. But what I'm saying is just take a chance. Just join a community group. Just start there. Come to church more regularly. Maybe not once or twice a month, but every week. Whatever it might be, just take your next step. I'm not saying just jump into like, you know, full confession. Of I mean, you do that too if you want. But what I'm saying is just take your next step and just trusting that the Lord's design for you is to be in a community where you're trusting God and connecting with his people so those people can connect you to the gospel. Father, as we uh, close our time here, we, we want to confess, Lord, just our, our emptiness and neediness for you. And we want to admit, God, that we so often have our roots, but we are not driving our roots into the water of the gospel. And we need help to do this. We need help to learn how to preach the gospel to ourselves and to be disciplined in the word and, and to be more vulnerable with each other. But we know that it is difficult for us oftentimes to do this. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit in us would lead us to this place. That you would lead us to streams of water that bring us life. As so we thank you, God, and we, uh, we love you so much. We're so grateful for everything you've done for us. We thank you for the truth of your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.